One thing I absolutely can promise everybody is lots of questions and very few answers at the moment. It's early days in the project, so this definitely comes into the kind of like the half baked um, category of um, tag talk. Um, and the plan is I'm going to rattle you through the whole concept of border studies and how archaeology and specialists in border studies can effectively work together. And then the second half of the talk is going to be why, rather than being on the periphery, actually dikes in the early, medi early medieval period are actually going to be kind of front and centre stage. Because it, it's going to be <coughs> um, at the same time, I also have to acknowledge Mike Middleton, thank you very much for allowing me to use your images um, from Wolfgang Bard on, on Twitter, um, because as you can see, it helps me kind of make the whole tapestry of then and now tie in together. So this is a bit of a gallop, so I apologise. Um, so archaeology and border studies and why mercy and monuments matter. So I'm going to talk about what contribution can border studies make to us as archaeologists, what can we pick and choose from, what can be most useful to us. Equally, what can we give to border studies? Um, how do we find this out? Um, what questions need to be asked from both communities? Um, then when we've actually established the questions, what kind of evidence do we need to draw on in order to allow us to start answering some of these questions? And finally, why is the West of Mercia such a good case study? Theoretical frameworks. The spatial term. Geographers, geopolitics, psychology, lots of different scholars coming together in a very interdisciplinary melting pot, starting to think about different ways um, of thinking about space. Not just space in terms of physical spaces in the landscape, but also about conceptual borders and how we think about them and how attitudes change over time. Um, and also borders as core. So not just looking at, you know, centre of empires, what have you. Oh, and there's all this stuff going on on the edge and we're really not particularly interested or keen on finding out. But no, actually putting them front and centre stage. Um, and actually viewing them there, as it says, unique environments of change, negotiation, exchange, expression and monumentalism. So borders are special. Um, so firstly, what can archaeology give to border studies? Well, most obviously, um, down the side of this um, slide, is we give it time depth. Um, a great deal of border studies and border theory at the moment is geared towards looking, not unreasonably, at contemporary issues around the globe. Um, but I'm sure as everybody in this room appreciates, there's only so much that you can glean from looking at the last 50, 100, couple of hundred years. You know, you're, you're, you're not really taking into um, account most of the journey that human beings have taken to get here. Um, we can help people who are interested in contemporary borders look at questions like, are we still doing what we've always done? Um, or are 21st century pressures about globalisation and state formation are those things really making our experience of borders unique or are we just doing the same <coughs> stuff over and over again? So how do we find out and what questions do we need to ask? Um, we've got to think about how we define borderlands. So, and what types of borders are there? So the hard borders, soft borders, borders as we've spoken about um, previously, about whether they're really quite short-term borders, whether they last for a long time in the landscape, and if they last for a long time, then how their meaning and their form changes over time. So what are the best questions? And how does everybody, not just the archaeologists, but the other scholars in other disciplines, handle time depth? So, there's like evidence for hard borders. What do they look like? Frontiers in the landscape. Evidence for soft borders. What can we actually look at to say, OK, this is a bit more difficult to model, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Um, evidence for how elites deal with borders, they're obviously the ones who've got the, the most um, invested in them. But equally, how does everybody else cope with just doing the basics in life around these very special kinds of landscapes? And now the enigma, in, enigma of mercy. Why is mercy such a good case study? Why is it so important? Why should we actually be working this as a, as a priority for archaeologists? <laughs> Um, and firstly, it's part of the history of a very, very long established border. This has been a border land right through prehistory, as established by the worker scholars like um, David Mullen, 
Um, it's also, whilst Mercia itself isn't particularly well documented anymore, it's a well established, well understood border over a long time period. Most importantly, it's still a border today. So we are able to talk to people whose experience of living in this environment now isn't just an artifact, it's something that's, that's ongoing. Early medieval landscape studies are uniquely well resourced because we've got place name stuff, we've got curation of previous monuments going on, and we do have some documentary evidence. So far from being in a very dark age indeed, I think as there's an actual, um, there's an argument to say that we're actually better off than lots of other scholars in lots of other time frames. And it's got one of the most significant earthwork monuments from any era, anywhere, sap in the middle of it. So that's why we should be looking at Office Dyken. What's Dyken? And then there's another phenomenon that's going on <laughs> at the moment. Um, how I pitch this bit, can I have a show of hands, please? A bit of interactivity, probably. Um, can I have a show of hands for who's got a Twitter account and who knows about Donald and Wolfgar the Bard? Okay, so there's a little bit of explaining to do um, for everybody else. So those who put their hands up, please bear with me. Um, <coughs> this, this MMGA, this Make Mercia Great Again zeitgeist that's going on at the moment on Twitter, um, I really think helps to nail the fact that this isn't just a group of scholars all who get this parody um, that's going on between Donald the Unready and events in the US. Um, Donald has just short of 100,000 followers on Twitter, so this is clearly something that's getting into the wider population's brain. This isn't just something that's concerning archaeologists and border, um, border studies experts. So there's something going on here that we should really seize upon, tease out, try and understand. So I'm not going to make any apologies for looking at the US-Mexican border and the Anglo-Welsh border, <coughs> um, mainly because the whole situation with Donald makes, the, makes that border you know, just in, totally irresistible for this talk. Um, but also um, the fact that there's a very unequal power balance going on here. So it just, it, it, it lends itself. So and some of the parallels that we can draw, for example, is the fact that these borders change spatially and over time. So we can see evidence here where you're actually looking at quite a hard border, a proper, proper frontier in both instances. You can see how there's also an urge to mark them, to put in, rather than just using a great long monument to try and cause a divide, you're actually marking notable places on both boundaries to say this border sits within this wider liminal environment. So what are things like the pillar of Alice telling us about how the wider environment is perceived? And also the fact that it's not consistent. This doesn't happen everywhere. So there were places where um, Deer and Herzog in their study of the American border in 2007 said that Conceptually, if you move that border 20 miles in either direction, nobody would notice. So that is such a culturally unique environment. So in the same way that we may or may not have these gaps in Offers Dyke, what's going on there? And I appreciate this is quite a simplistic comparison, but I'm just trying to say that, that there are, are we special in the 21st <coughs> century or are there, are there commonalities that we can tease out over time? You can't walk away from the winged messengers. So just as Offer <coughs> was using the Angel of Litchfield to try and make a statement about his place in the world, you can't stay away from Donald Trump. And even if you stay away from Donald Trump himself, you have difficulty staying away from people talking about what Donald Trump's done on Twitter. And place in the wide world. Now, nobody would necessarily imply that Offer was Charlemagne's puppet. But nevertheless, you can see that they are both very conscious of their place in the wider political environment of early medieval Europe. So who's pulling whose strings, where you are in the hierarchy is clearly of very great importance to these rulers as well. And 
having looked at skipped over what the, the um, leaders are doing, of course everybody else is having to rub along in these environments. You've still got to feed your family, you've still got to fall in love, get married, commit a crime, um, all sorts of things, trade. And so this can then result in a, a multivocal environment. So one of the things I'm interested in is how much evidence are we able to tease out on the ground about how multivocal um, offers dive might be in the environment around it. So you've got a hard border there with power and mercy standing off against each other. And you've got, I'm sure she's a totally charming lady, there with her um, US flag demanding that her borders are secured. Um, in contrast, we have Paddington, because I thought that was just too good a um, poster not to use. Um, and equally, there are, there's evidence for negotiation around offers diet in terms of people actually making agreements between each other to say, well, okay, whilst all this is going on at the top, we are going to make agreements about how we trade, how we handle um, judicial disputes, etc. But working with all these scholars from all these other disciplines, clearly, you know, you, you've got to think, well, they're going to be downsides as well, and clearly they are. Um, firstly, something that we're very familiar with as archaeologists is the fact that we don't project our contemporary responses to the early, early medieval period back and that's something that even compared to prehistorians that obviously we battle with more because they can look superficially so much more like us yeah, even though clearly they aren't um, <coughs> so that's something that despite the fact that on a very shallow level we can pick out similarities and that can make us go Ooh, clearly it must be the same thing going on we've got to be very reflective and make sure that we don't fall into that trap. Um, there's also a risk that the more we exchange and involve ourselves with a dialogue to um, scholars outside our own discipline, that we get subsumed into their dominant disciplines. So I'm not necessarily that every conversation with a geographer um, you need to go in with your fingers crossed behind your back, but nevertheless, it's, it's something that we have to be aware of and the fact that we, um, we don't slip into that trap. Um, and also that the wider the dialogues that we risk archaeological data being open to wider misinterpretation and clearly um, in the current political <coughs> climate that's something that we all have to be even more aware of than normal and I'm sure there are other potential pitfalls as well but those were just the key three ones that I could fit on the slide. So what does all this mean for our understanding of our past? and our present and particularly of Mercia and I think it means that today we have a really great opportunity to engage in interdisciplinary debate to draw in other disciplines frameworks to pick and choose and decide what actually works for archaeology and what doesn't I think it's an opportunity for archaeologists <coughs> to really make a statement on the on the big interdisciplinary stage about we can give you time, depth, to understanding exactly the kind of chaos that's happening in the 21st century. And what it means for Mercia, and the West of Mercia in particular, I think, is that sites go from being literally and metaphorically on the periphery of early medieval studies to actually potentially having a really important place um, <coughs> in the centre of these kind of studies. And... How long have I got, Howard? You're all right for another minute, yeah. Yep. A shameless plug for the COSM project. Um, this is the Community Stewardship of Mercian Monuments project um, that operates under the, um, the umbrella of the collaboratory, um, but which is very much a bottom-up project. So um, there's a bunch of us working with communities up and down the dike, encouraging them to contribute to a common framework where they look after, they monitor, they record the dike in their own um, settlement, but then that goes into an online resource, which collectively then obviously is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, so if that's of any interest to you whatsoever, <coughs> um, grab me or grab Ian Mackey over there. Put your hand up properly so people can see you. Yes. So um, 
either one of us, if you want to talk to us about it, um, then that would be great. And I think that's it. Thank you.